Well, good morning. We're going to continue with John today. Uh, I'm kind of excited to get to this part and a little intimidated. As we've talked about, uh, we're going to be start. Well, we're starting with uh, 13 today. We'll be covering 13 and 14. <clears throat> but uh, this is the section that uh, is mainly Jesus' teachings. And so, in some ways, when you're when you're or at least for me, when I'm trying to cover things in a class, it's, it's, and we're trying to cover so much, it's a little easier when things are broken into segments, like this happened here, this happened here, then they moved to here. You know? And now you get into Jesus' teachings where you know, every verse and almost every word is just packed with, with meaning and power. Not that the rest isn't, but it's just, I think you know what I mean. <clears throat> for a little bit of review, last, I've, last week I, I mentioned the... Uh, one way that this is broken into, uh, John is broken into uh, an outline, and it's probably, for what I found, probably the most common uh, way that if you just go find a, a major commentary, I told you about finding the one uh, that was as thick as a phone book, and that was impressive until I, re until I realized that was volume one of three <laughs> on just John. And that outline uses that commentary. It was the... I'm having a blank, but I'll remember it. Anchor commentary uses this outline of the book of signs and the book of glory. And through chapter 12 is a book of signs. As you can imagine, that's where Jesus does a lot of signs. And then the book of glory is where Jesus' glory is being revealed through both the Passion Week, uh, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. And last week we wrapped up with chapter 11, wrapped up 11 and 12 in the book of signs with Jesus raising Lazarus and the symbolism there as well as the, the miracle. Mary's anointing of Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus entered into uh, Jerusalem with the large crowds and the king of Israel, all of that. And then he reveals his hour has come, which as we've talked about, that's been a major theme. My hour has not come, he tells Mary, his mother, early on. And uh, he brings this up repeatedly. And now he's saying the hour has come uh, to glorify the, the Father. Last week we talked quite a bit, uh, or I did, about the light metaphor that Jesus uses. And we know I am the light, but in John, just over and over, he brings up this light and darkness uh, motif, if you want to call it that. Uh, <clears throat> and he, he reveals you'll have the light with you only a little longer. I believe in the light so that you may become sons or children of light. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And I want to emphasize that today, uh, even though it's not a major theme in these two chapters, but there is a, a place that I think is, is pretty neat. And so we'll get to that. And in 13 and 17, it's, like I said, it's mainly focused on Jesus' teachings. To his, and this is to his closest disciples. Um, one thing I've thought about as I've looked at this is uh, how a lot of these teachings aren't new to us or in John. The, he's reinforcing a lot of things that he's already taught, and, and he does have some new, new, new things that he throws into the mix. <clears throat> but the thing that I thought about is... Uh, Perhaps it's because of watching The Chosen in the last few months. It just reminded me to think about all the hundreds and perhaps thousands of hours Jesus spent with the disciples. Uh, walking along the roads, all those times that they went to Jerusalem, but that was uh, not just a, a, a walk in the park. You know, It was uh, 30, 40, maybe more hours of just walking together. And... Uh, all the e the nights they spent around campfires, maybe you know hundreds probably more than likely, where they just talked with Jesus, they listened, they asked questions, and you can imagine as they came to this, they they a lot of these were probably repeat to him. And there's some people that look at this. Uh, I'm not one of them, but they look at this section as uh, excuse me, pulling on my microphone here. The transforming word calls this a uh, Jesus' farewell sayings. And 
I was kind of struck in there because uh, I'm always looking for outlines or how to break things up, you know. He said, really, there's no structure, the, the commentary says in that. And it's, it's almost like a collection of sayings. So it's best to focus on themes. Well, I'm still looking for organization because I like organization. And uh, <clears throat> other authors had different views, but I'm struck by that. But whether, whether it's a collection of sayings that were put together or one discourse, I tend to go with that because that's the way it was written and given to us. It is, it is uh, interesting to ask to me why these things did he emphasize here or reemphasize over and over. And we could, we could spend time on that, but I'll just leave that as something to think about. And just a reminder, in 13 and 14, well, we have almost five chapters of Jesus talking, if you will. And we're, we're going to stop at a few places where the disciples ask questions and have some discussion there. But chapters 13 and 14 are at the Last Supper. Even though it's not real specific, we can know from the other Gospels there. And then at the end, as we'll see in 14, it ends, uh, Jesus said, let, let us rise and go from here. And the next three chapters, he continues his teaching, and the assumption is <clears throat> this is on the way to Gethsemane because it's evening, and uh, that's, what, that's what they, where they end up with, with the arrest. So we have three chapters of, of Jesus teaching just on the way to Gethsemane, but it's all one big discussion with the disciples. So today we're going to hit 13, 14, as I said. Um, 13, well, my hope is to cover, I, I'm plan to cover 13, most of 13, and then I wasn't quite sure how to teach the last part of 13 and 14 or how to organize that, so I'm going to let you guys do that. So we're going to have a little discussion on that. So if you're the type to read ahead, go ahead. Uh, in 13, we start with, now before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, it says, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What a, just a neat, we could spend all class on that. That's pretty. And then down in verse three is another just, to me, just really powerful. Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all, given all things into his hand, and so, and knowing that he had come from God, and knowing that he was going back to God, rose from supper, and he proceeded to wash feet. I mean, I just think of those. I mean, you've, you've heard lessons on those. It's just knowing uh, that the Father had given him all things, that he had come from God and was going from back to God. And what does he do with that? What, what an amazing intro into the idea of serving. It just, anyway, it's just, just really powerful. So, um, <clears throat> but as we do, we're not going to spend any time on that, and you're welcome to comment. Uh, at any time, but later. Uh, but he rose from the supper and he washed feet. Yeah, but notice I skipped verse 2. Sandwich in between these two just wonderfully powerful, just moving statements. Uh, during the supper, when the devil had already put it, uh, put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And then it continues, Jesus knowing the Father. You've got this little statement about Satan and Judas. And John has been doing this, and he's really going to do it in this chapter, where he just slips in these little things about Judas and one that's going to betray Jesus. It's almost like if you've seen a movie, everything's rocking along, but in their background there's this character or there's music that pops up. In, in Mel Gibson's the, the Passion, you see there's a scene when Jesus is going to the cross where there's in the background there's this evil character that just kind of is moving along in it. Uh, if you want to get really astray, what I think of is the music in Jaws. <laughs> You've got it. Bo Anyway. And, uh, yeah. And Satan entered to Judas. And then they go back to playing on the beach. And then, anyway, and then the little boy goes out in the water. Anyway. So it's kind of almost like that. So we're back to washing feet in verses 6 to 8. I don't want to go through all that, but as we know, Peter objects and says, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm trying to be humble. And Jesus said, well, if you didn't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. Well, then wash all of me. So 
So Peter, being the impetuous one, uh, jumps up, and, and eventually Jesus washes his feet. He teaches. And Jesus explains, starts explaining in verse 14, If I, your, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you, should, you ought to do so for one another. Now, you're welcome. I mean, I would appreciate any correction on this. But the best of my memory, and I didn't, didn't research this real heavy, I think this is the first of time in all of John that there's a reference to one another or how you treat each other, which is so big. It just struck me because it's so big in Matthew. All the one another's, you know, all this neat. And the other, other gospels in John, the focus has been, he has been focused on who Jesus is. And he's with the Father and one with the Father, from the Father, by the authority of the Father, all, all this with his identity and trusting in him, believing in him, having faith in him, and building that. And you see that building. But there's been, there's just been very, no teaching or very little teaching, if there has been, on this is how you treat one another. I just thought, thought that was interesting, the shift there. And so he, he does this. Um, and then he expands on this. A servant is not greater than his master. This is down around 16. And you are blessed if you do these things. So again, if you do these things to others, you're going to be blessed. So now he, he, he's shifting. And I won't say it's a total shift, but it's, he starts feeding these in, in there. And this is with his closest disciples, the ones he spent all the time. And then we have this little Jaws music again, and Jesus refers to the betrayer, only it's gotten a little bigger this time. To fulfill scripture, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Uh, I never really spent on the, any time on that. Uh, but what I found is there is, a, there is a verse in Psalm 41, maybe many of you know it, and it, he, he refers to David, think, think David's the author. Even my close friend, this is in verse 9 of 41, even my close friend in whom I have trusted has lifted his heel against me. And I, from what I read, I don't know whether this is a fulfillment of that or whether that idea of lifting your heel was a common phrase. It may have just been a common phrase and maybe it was from that. But the idea of lifting the heel, what, what I did find on that, and in some translations magnified his heel, it's one, a couple of the illustrations was like a horse that would rear up and stomp you with his heel. Or someone in a race who might trip you and then while you were down, lift their foot and stomp you were down. I mean, this is betrayal that Jesus is talking about pretty severe. Uh, a couple of points that I wanted to hit on this passage before we move on. And again, you're welcome to jump in anytime. Uh, is note in verse two and three, uh, it says during the supper, and then it said later it says Jesus rose from the supper. This is the only reference in John to the supper that we think of as the Last Supper. There's no description of when I take this cup, when I you know take this bread, share this bread. There's no uh, you know uh, just no reference to 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 the supper at all. So there's. There's two things here. I mean, there's two things about it. one. It doesn't mention the supper, and I hadn't even I hadn't really caught about this caught this until one person I read pointed back to. It is interesting though that John, in one way, has already referenced what we think of at least the the theme of the supper, the last supper, back after the feeding of the five thousand, when Jesus teaches about I am the bread. And you must, let me quote this right, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. So that theme is already there, even though John doesn't mention it specifically here, what happens, which, anyway. Then there's one, and you can take this and toss it out. This is, a, this is from the Arthur messed up version. The <clears throat> something that occurred to me, and I, and I really haven't found anything on this. Um, is we know this is a passage about this washing feet is about serving and serving others and, and the master becoming the servant and, and just all the symbolism there. But I couldn't help but think because we just talked about chapter 11. The last time and only time we'd heard about washing feet was Mary washing feet. And that was very clearly referenced as Mary anointing Jesus. I'd never really thought about 
that perhaps in addition to the idea of servanthood, that Jesus was anointing. Because it wasn't, uh, the reason I mentioned that during the supper, uh, one author did, one commentator did mention this, that when you think of washing the feet in the sense of back then your feet were dirty and one of the things that would happen is a, a servant would come in and clean everybody's feet before they sat down. This happened during the supper. So I always think of this happening when everybody comes in and they're grubby and all this good stuff and they wash their feet. They, they were already in the middle of supper when Jesus did this. And if you look at Mary, the instance with Mary, you kind of have to infer, but it's have some inference there, but it's, it's similar. It's during, it appears to be during the meal. So I almost wonder if Jesus wasn't anointing and blessing his disciples, using this as a, as a way to anoint them. Uh, take it for what it's worth. And now we move down to 21 through 30, and we'll have a bigger, we have a bigger section on Judas here. Jesus is troubled in his spirit. Uh, one will betray me. And Peter asked John, or the one that's closest to Jesus, well, this again is just a Dave thing, so you can take it for what it's worth. Peter has already gotten in trouble in the supper, right? I kind of wonder why, wondered why Peter didn't ask Jesus directly. Then it occurred to me, maybe, hey, you know, he tells John, I've already, I'm already in trouble here. Would you ask you? No, I don't know that that happened. <laughs> and Jesus says the one who eats this morsel of bread uh, will be the one, or, or if I, did, I guess I didn't say this. Peter asked, who is it? Who's the one who's going to betray you? And then he gives it to Judas. There's a little bit of confusion to me on who knows and who sees this. Um, but Judas, Jesus, Judas took the bread, and here we have the reference again. Satan entered into him. And Jesus whispers to him, and what, what you, or says to him, what, are you, what you're going to do, do quickly. The other disciples did not understand this. And after receiving the bread, Judas immediately left. And then there's this little verse, and it was night. Another one of those things I just never mentioned. Uh, I can see some of you shaking your head. You've thought about this. The idea of the ref reference to the dark and light. And we can think of all kinds of things here. Uh, John, and earlier in John 3, he says, for everyone who does evil hates the light. Uh, when Judas wa and when Judas walks in darkness, or you could say when anyone walks in darkness, that opens the door for Satan to enter. I mean, you could make all kinds of neat, well, serious points with this. Uh, so he tells, uh, through this, Jesus has probably, I think it's seven or eight times he's mentioned the betrayer. Or John has mentioned it in, in his letter. Uh, why is it so, you know, feed in there so much? Uh, when Jesus talks about it, he talks it so you will know and you will believe that this is all part of the plan. God knew, knew this. This, isn't, this wasn't something that undermined his plan. So before we move, this is just about, hey, we're almost on time. Before we move into this last section where we'll have discussion, um, any thoughts on these two sections? Because I've looked through them pretty quickly. Gary. Something that I think I just noticed for the very first time ever. And I don't know the significance of it, but I'll just say what I have to say and y'all can think about it. He said, I'm going to hand this to the person that's going to betray me. Since they were reclining at table, the only way he could hand it to Judas was that Judas either had to be with arms, within arm's reach, which is close, as close as John, not as close as Peter, possibly, maybe. You see what I'm saying? Or he has to get up and go walk around and hand it to him. I think it's probably the first. Judas was close. Ooh. That kind of ties with the, uh, even though Ju Jesus knows this is going to happen, if, if you think of that psalm where it says, my friend. Uh, anyway, uh, 
Gerald? Yes, I had actually read two different commentaries that, based on the words used here, said that John was to the right of Jesus with Peter next to him on his right, and Judas was immediately on Jesus' left-hand side. Um, it was an interesting presentation and, you know, hmm. fairly convicting, actually, when I, when I read That's it. interesting. I don't remember the name of either of the, of the concordance, of the uh, books, but um, it, it would explain, and in, in, in it made me think, it's almost like Jesus was giving Judas one last chance to choose not to go to the dark mm -hmm. side. Uh, having him there so close and obviously, you know, a personal interaction is promoted by that, by being chosen to sit next to Jesus. Those are neat thoughts together, uh, to think of it that way. But, uh, hmm. That's great. Anyone else before we move? Okay, I'm going to briefly summarize 31 through 35. This is in chapter 13. Because uh, Jesus makes a few comments right after Judas leaves. He speaks about, now the Son of Man is glorified. Is that a reference to Judas' betrayal? Is inaction? I don't know. There could be other things. I am with you a little while longer. Where I'm going, you cannot come. That's going to be an important statement coming up on the next part. Uh, he had actually told the Jews this in, in chapter 7. And a new command I give you, love one another as I've loved you. And he'll repeat this again in another chapter. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples. So we, again, we have another section where he's talking about the one another. What I wanted to spend a little bit of time, we have 15 minutes maybe, is um, I joked about you all finishing the rest of the class, which is, which is a little seriousness too, but... Um, this isn't a perfect way to frame this, but if you're skimming your head, and I've highlighted uh, in chapter 13, we have Peter at the end, in 36, we have Peter ask a question. Then in first part of 14, we have Thomas ask a question. Then Simon, may, Simon I mean, excuse me, Philip ask a question or makes a statement. And then Judas, not Iscariot, makes ask a question. So what I've done is I'm going to mention these questions, and these are all clarifications they're asking for. Let's see if I can do this. Apologize to those of you on Zoom. I know it's hard to see the board. I'll try to repeat everything. Uh, what I've put on the board is basically broke this into four sections with Peter, Thomas, Philip, Judas, which Carolyn came up with, PT in your PJs. <laughs> which sounds worse than it is. It means exercise. Okay. Uh, Peter asked, and I've remembered because I was trying to remember which order. Now, who was in the next? Who was, okay. So, remember Jesus said, you know, that I'm going to go away. And Peter says, where are you going? And then he has a follow-up question after Jesus answered. Why can't I follow you? Because Jesus says, you can't, you can't follow me. And then Thomas later on says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Philip says, this will make more sense if you're, if you're reading this right now, this section. Uh, because Jesus is pretty direct in his answers, I think. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. It almost seems like a detour. But I almost read it. I, I read it again in my skewed way of thinking. Philip is going, okay, I don't get any of that. Just show us the Father, and we'll be good. That's great. Which is kind of ironic because Jesus has talked about the Father just the verse before. And then Judas, when we get down to Judas, asked, Lord, uh, Jesus has just said he'll manifest himself to them. How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. And Jesus answers, and, and like was mentioned last week, and I can't remember, was it you, Gary, or Lawrence? One of you mentioned, you know, Jesus takes these occasions to teach and broaden 
you know, a lot of times questions or, or events. So it may not, some of these may, aren't necessarily directly in response to their, their question, but he goes through that. What I wanted to ask today, as you look through these, uh, what would be some themes or major points that, that just stand out to you? And I will put those briefly on the board to any of those four questions. And if you'll tell me, tell us which one uh, that you found it under. Lawrence. And we have a mic ready to pass around if you don't want to get up. Where he says, again, uh, I am in the Father, the Father's me. Basically, we're all one uh, entity here. And, and uh, he reinforces that at this okay. point. And which one was that? Uh, which section? Up in the, well, it's at the top of the page. This okay. <laughs> uh, 13, believe me that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. I know that passage, but I'm not striking where it's at. Uh, well, oh, oh you're, in, you're in 14, uh, 11, right? Believe in the, me that I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. Well, is that the right one? If it's not, yes, just... that's correct. Okay. Now we've heard that a few times, haven't we, and John? What else? <coughs> I'll give you time to browse. But you only have 10 seconds. I'll take a drink. That'll make you at ease. No, just any themes that you see in Jesus' answers that stand out to you. Don't be troubled. Where's that at? Trick question. Troubled. And I believe it's over here, too. I may have it in the wrong place. Don't let your hearts be troubled. It's after Peter's? Yeah. Whoops. Okay. That's right. That's right. So. There's also the way that he's speaking to these grown men. He calls them little children. Mm -hmm. You know, in verse 33. I know. I know. Oh. I have all people. <laughs> so the way he's talking to the apostles is very affectionate and treating them like children, you know, little children. And then later he says, I won't leave you as orphans. He's, he's, he's feeling very paternal toward them, very okay. protective toward them. And it's, it's touching, you know. I'm for him put, to be so affectionate to them. That's actually a little before Peter's question, but we'll, good point, children. Wow, we can't read that one, but that's okay. <laughs> it's not just your eyes, zoom, Zoomers. It's really that bad. Okay. Thank you. Good thoughts. Now, I have all these points, but it'd be better if y'all... <laughs> Well, I, I'm sure this is not one of them, but one of the ways I would organize this <laughs> section is Jesus is once again very clearly saying, I am God, I am other. We can't. I, I, I'm not staying here. I have to go, and you are not going now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the otherness is coming across again. In fact, uh, the other Judas kind of comments comments on it. you're manifesting yourself to us why not to the whole world i'm not i'm not of this world this that's not my mission i'm going to write that over just not of this world i think that's a big theme 
Thank you. Well, I'll fumble around and you all just jump in there when you're ready uh, with a couple things. Of course, we have Peter's rejection. So Peter's having a tough night. Okay. Uh, the let not your heart be troubled, as I mentioned, it's twice. Uh, I think this is one of those cases you could really make. The, I mean, you could really make the case for bookends. There's a lot there, but then there's a lot outside of those two, too. Um, one of the big themes in this is I am going away and I will come again in various ways that come, comes up. Um, and then he says, this is in the section 14. I messed up my papers here. Oh, in 14.4, sorry. You know the way to where I'm going. And then what's, his, what's the first question right after that? We do not know the way you're going. <laughs> <laughs> this strikes me. Almost every one of these. And then he talks about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is the sixth metaphor most people point to. And this one, you, I mentioned about all of, to me, all of the metaphors lead to life. And this one's very direct. No one comes to the Father uh, except through me. This is verse six. Uh, six. Uh, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then the follow-up question is, Lord, show us the Father. <laughs> Does that sound like us or what? Um, <laughs> we don't get it. Which relates to what Gary mentioned, you know. I'm sorry, did you have something? Yeah. From now on, you know, Jen just said he's pretty literal. From now on, you know him. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Uh, because I am here. And then Jesus kind of gives him a, one of those talks. You still do not know? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And he talks about it not speaking about my own authority. Um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is the second time in the last chapter or two he said that. Now we get the Father will give you a helper. This is around verse 18, somewhere in there. To be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, again, he's very direct. But you know him. The world won't know him, but you know him. Present tense. For he dwells in you and will be in you, present and future. Pretty cool how he mixes things up. You will know that I am in the Father, and you, and excuse me, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Way back when, uh, got early on in the class, I talked about chasing this idea of the Father, that the is you so much, almost exclusively in John, with Father, instead of my, our. And I had a conversation that lasted about three seconds with Jeff Peterson, some of you know him. He uh, was a professor at Austin grad, a uh, Greek, Greek scholar and a New Testament scholar. And a bunch of us were having lunch, and I asked him, Jeff, why, does, why is that emphasized so much in John? And uh, he made me feel good because he said, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. Why the Father? But he, then he went on to say something that changed almost all of John for me. And just as some people can do in one sentence, he just captured this thing that I, I can't do in one sentence. He said, the is one of those, it's kind of an ambiguous term. It can mean my, you put it in there when it means my, and in the Greek this was the case, or it can mean our. And usually you can take it both ways in that particular, in the, whatever the context is. And this is the part that caught me was he said, you, uh, John is bi building this, you know, that I am in the Father, he is in me, we are one. 
and the disciples are coming along and their faith is building and they're, and they're having questions. Some are coming to him and some are leaving. And some, all the way along, you see the same disciples. Jesus says, believe in me, trust in me. This trust is building. And now we start seeing, and this is what Jeff said, then toward, toward 14, 15, 16, 17, you start seeing a shift where Jesus uses phrases like, we are one. You and I are one. And he's not just talking about the Father. Now the disciples, he's been moving the disciples along and growing the disciples along to where they are one with him and one with the Father. And so you, you have this movement all through John with faith and trust, which I thought, boy, does that fit our, our theme? Because that's what we're seeking to do is to be one with the Father. And to, as, as hard as it sounds, to think about, to move to a place where we react to life, we live life as he would. Now, we're never going to do that because we don't, we don't even, can't even start to comprehend. But to be that, to, to move there is, is neat. And to see Jesus move the disciples that direction is, is pretty cool. So I, I just thought that was, and he, of course, I said, like I said, he did that in one sentence. I go, wow, I never thought of that. I've been studying this for three months. It never occurred to me. Okay. Um, yeah, Cheryl. I was just intrigued with Jen's point, and I was going to read further. And I can't. Where is the from now on thing? I I couldn't find it. I know I we just read it, but I don't see it anywhere. If, if you if somebody could tell me, we can move on and just slip me the info later. From now on. seven. Thanks, Dale. 47. I knew it, but I didn't know it. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Really cool. Then in, uh, when did I see? I'm going to read this again in a minute, but I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Okay, that's, we're familiar with that. And my father will love him. And then he says, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that a cool thought? We will come to with him and make our home with him. Um, oh, we're almost out of time. Then Jesus says a little farther along in 20. This is in, I forgot to write it down, 28, the last half of 28. He says, he's talking about going again to the Father. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father. Follow up. That, um, boy, we could spend what a great sermon. I mean, to think about uh, probably, probably one of the, I don't know if it's the hardest things since becoming a Christian to really internalize. Rational, ra rationally, I can understand this, but the whole rejoicing when someone goes to the Father. And really, really feeling that is, is uh, anyway, because just the idea of someone being with the Father, and that's what he's saying about, if, if you love me, you would be rejoicing because I'm going to be with the Father. Now, I mean, he's with the Father, and of course we don't understand how all this stuff works, but he's going to be back with the Father. What? Well, anyway, I didn't need to. I am going to, Close. Did you have a comment? I Go did. Ahead. I'm sorry. Adam. Yeah. No, as you say, I noticed last week, one of the things Danny was saying in the sermon, I think it was last week, was about um, King Jehoshaphat and how it mentions David as his father, even though David is clearly not his father, Asa is. Mm -hmm. So we can gain. So obedience equals love. Obedience equals family always, all the time, for all of us, always. It is not blood. It is chosen relationship mm. i just thought that was neat. that's a neat Dave, can I just say one quick sure sure go ahead you know yesterday we went to houston for memorial service for my sister-in-law's mother and she had uh, lived 90 years she had her 90th birthday two weeks ago and was spry and active and 
you know, for, for a 90 year old. And then she just totally declined. But the thing that she did is she continually prepared all her life. She has been preparing her family and living just a, a beautiful example, her and her husband, both of, um, God working through them in this, in this, you know, on this earth. But she kept telling them, I'm ready to go to heaven. Hmm. I can't wait to go to heaven. Why hasn't God taken me to heaven? Wow. <laughs> Prep, prepare, prepare your life lived. I can't wait. And yesterday at the memorial service was probably one of the most rejoicing memorial services that we've been to. Hmm. So. Wow. That was neat. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. I have been uh, kind of enjoying ending class with a, some assurances or comforting words, which we've already discussed a lot of these. I mean, that's about as good as it gets. What Twyla was just saying. But I'm going to hit anyway um, in my last minute here. In 1420, I'm going to work backwards here because I'm going to, uh, in 1427, Jesus says again, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And just a few few things, and we've touched base on these in 14.3, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again. In 7, we just talked about this. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So somebody stole my notes. I think that was June. Uh, I shouldn't have left these up here. In 1617, the Father will give you another helper to be with you forever. And you know him, for he dwells in you and you will be, it will be in you. 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. In 1427, Peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you, give, give to you, not as the world gives. But so much assurance in this and comfort in this letter. Thank you. That's next week is 15 and 16. Thanks for great comments and, and the bad comments too. No, thanks. <laughs>